Now it's good to see you in the house of the Lord again today on this beautiful Lord's Day. We welcome every one of you. We appreciate our visitors. We want you to know you're welcome here at Northside. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church. It's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. And we're hoping during this hour coming up, we can be a real inspiration to you. I'm sure many shut-ins would like to be listening to this hour. And if you know of a shut-in, you in the radio listen audience, it's maybe not tuned in to WNGC, get on your phone and, and tell them to tune in to WNGC. Get the singing and the preaching of God's Word, and you'll be doing them a favor. Take your Bible today and turn, will you please, to 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18. And James chapter 5, I'm speaking to you on this subject, seven companies in a dry parts land. I want you to listen to the message and get what God has to say from the scriptures. So you turn to 1 Kings chapter 17, you find it on page 411, then 1 Kings chapter 18, and then of course James chapter 5. I was speaking to the dear gentleman last Sunday that when he met me, he said I didn't look like a sound or something to that effect. You know, when you hear someone on the radio and you hear them many, many times, you size them up in your mind as to what they look like. I've met a lot of people since I've been on the radio now in my 36 year daily. And when I tell them who I am, they look kind of surprised. And so I heard this past week what I look like or who I look like and who I preach somewhat like. I heard in the last a couple of weeks that I've preach somewhat like Jimmy Swaggart and I look like Johnny Cash. So I don't uh, agree with either one, but uh, that's a matter of people's opinion, I guess. So you turn in the scriptures now to these places. While you're turning there, I'd like to say that I have some information in print here. You know, last couple of weeks you've heard a lot about abortion. You've heard a lot about a fetus, uh, whether it's a real human being or whatnot. I have some printed matter here on two sides, both sides of this uh, sheet of paper I have that's very, very interesting for, along this line. And uh, if you'd like to have it, if you write in and just say, Preach Edward, send me the printed matter about abortion or uh, whether or not a fetus is a human being or what that you mentioned on Sunday on the broadcast, I'll send it to you at free of charge. By the way, stamps went up this morning at 12 o'clock. 22 cents now for a stamp. And uh, that means our radio expense, you know, goes up two pennies to a letter. But anyway, we appreciate you that write in and request these things. We're glad to send them to you free of charge. But if you'd kindly remember that it cost us, maybe drop a stamp in the envelope or something, we'd appreciate it. This is a faith ministry. We're doing what we can to get out the gospel depending on God's people to work with us in getting out the gospel during these days. So I hope you'll pray for us. I'm reminded, I believe last week I read about this gentleman. His wife is forever shifting the furniture around in the home. Now, a lot of women like that. My wife's pretty bad to do that. I never question her on that matter. If she wants to put the dining room in the, in the bedroom, be all right with me. If she wants to put the bedroom in the den, that'll be all right with me too. I just so she lets me know when it's time to eat and time to go to bed. So I don't uh, have any quarrel with her about that. But this lady was bad to move a funny to around. And then one night about midnight, somebody knocked on the front door. The husband, about half asleep, jumped up and uh, ran his head into the side of a wall. And he hollered back at his wife, said, Wife, said, where in the high heaven did you put the front door? Well... 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning with verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was in the habits of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Keith, that is beyond Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Now turn over to chapter 18, verse 1, 1 Kings. 
And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab. There was a sore famine in Samaria. Now I want you to turn to the book of James, away over in the New Testament, page 1310, in the original Schofield Reference Bible. Page 1310. I began reading with verse uh, uh, 13. Is any man among you, let him be, is, is any among you afflicted, let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing songs. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, let them pray over him, and on him with all of the name of the Lord. And the proud faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. If he have committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, pray one for another, that you may be healed. The affection fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now notice verse 17. Elias, that is Elijah, was a man subject to like passion as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. It rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again. And the heavens gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. Now I want to speak to you about this prophet, this great man of God, Elijah. And here as we... Uh, read about him, we find seven outstanding companies here in this part of the land where he dwelt. Now Elijah the Tishbite came out of the mountain. Early rain and the latter rain, and they could gather their fruits and have plenty to eat. And everything would run along smoothly, but if they failed, obey God. God said, I will send a drought upon you, and I will chastise you in that respect. Now that's exactly what happened. They failed to honor God. They did not abide by the rules, the regulations that God gave them the word. And God sent a three and a half year drought upon the land. Now can you imagine what the land would look like after having not rain fall upon it in three and a half years, not even dew to come up from the ground. And it was very, very dry. And in this condition, the men of God, the prophet of God ministered. He had to minister to the White House. He had to go and talk to old King Ahab. Now the name Ahab means uncle. That's strange, isn't it? Uncle Ahab. How does that sound? If it had been in our day, it would probably been Uncle Sam. But this was Uncle Ahab that he had to deal with. And the prophets of Baal, no later Jezebel, one of the most wicked women that ever walked on the face of the earth. Old King Ahab, her husband, poor henpecked feller, one of the most wicked kings that ever lived in Israel. And God had sent the droughts upon the land because of their disobedience. And so as this man of God ministers, I want us to notice seven different companies. Now it'd take me two hours to really preach this message. So I'm going to get as much in as I can in the next few minutes. And I want you to follow me. Number one, we see company number one, the Ahabites, the self-seekers. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 42, Ahab went up to eat and to drink. Now this man Ahab had food in his home. He had water to drink and all his people starving. They could not get water. They did not have crops. And he was far more concerned about himself, about his cattle and his, his horses and so forth than he was about his people. He was a lover of self. The Bible said in the end time, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. It also said whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. And so we're living in days when people now are more concerned about themselves than they are about God or their neighbor or anyone else. And we find that company. Then we find company number two. That is the mourners over the drought. Now the land no doubt looked terrible. It hadn't rained in three and a half years. Very dry. Not even any dew on the ground. And they begin to mourn over the drought. They could see the great cracks in the ground. As they milled around, they saw the poor cattle starving to death. They saw the trees drying up. They saw the grass dying and turning brown. But they did nothing about it. God had told them what to do in the Old Testament. God had told them plainly in the book of Deuteronomy. He told them what to do about this, but they hadn't really done anything about it. They could have. They could have done something about it, but they'd been led astray by old lady Jezebel. She's the daughter of the priest of Bel. Her daddy was named El Bel, and her name was Jezebel. And they worshiped Bel, a false god, a sun god in those days. 
And they could have done something about it, but they did not. They mourned and they groaned about the land drying up, trees drying up, cattle dying, no water for the horses, everything going wrong, just walking around mourning and groaning. Now we have a lot of church members like that today and we're all guilty. We mourn and we groan about not seeing things happen, about not seeing uh, our souls saved and people lifted and helped and strengthened spiritually. And we moan about it, we groan about it, but many times we fail to do anything about it. Now the way we should get something done about that is what God required of them. That is, abide by the word of God and spend much time in prayer. Old Uncle Bud Robinson, a preacher many years gone by, went from place to place preaching and he went to this church and it was dead spiritually. And he stayed in the preacher's home and and then he went to his bedroom that night and he started praying. You can hear him about a mile across the mountains as he prayed. And uh, the pastor walked over and tapped on the door and said, uh, uh, Bud said, uh, God's not deaf. You don't have to pray that loud. He said, I know God's not deaf. but said, there's something else I know. He said, God is nowhere near this place. And so he just kept on praying. You can hear him across the mountain two or three miles away. Levy, we need to realize that God will heal the land. God will send the rain. God will give the grass and so forth whenever we meet the conditions. So we come then to company number three, and that is a 7,000. Now in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18, Yet I have left me 7,000 Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. Now we find here that Elijah, after he had done the will of God, after he had preached and warned the people, then he became somewhat discouraged. And that's natural, that's human. Now when you do something for God and God blesses you, the devil is coming along immediately to try to discourage you, to get you to cease doing what you've been doing for God, to try to discourage you, to hinder you in any way he possibly can. So he came to try to hinder Elijah and discourage him. And poor old Elijah sitting there, mourning and groaning, thinking he was the only one left in the land that was really preaching. He thought, well, old lady Jezebel, she's killed out all the preachers. She destroyed all the prophets. And I'm the only one left. And God said, now listen, Elijah, you're not the only one uh, in the land. He said, I want you to know there's 7,000 that's not bowed their knee to Baal. God had other people there as well in the land that knew God but they were not doing very much. They hadn't heard anything from them about them. And the same things applied to many of our churches today. We have saved people, born again believers. They sit in the house of God, but they don't do very much for God. You don't hear about them winning any souls. You don't hear about them really spending hours in prayer. You don't hear about them really emptying up their pocketbooks when you pass the collection plate. And you just don't hear much about them. They're saved. But they're like these where God said, now, Elijah, you're not alone. There are 7,000 more people here in Israel that's never yet bowed down and worshipped the sun God Baal. I want you to know that. And so when you begin to feel like you're alone and you're the only one persecuted and you're the only one that's really doing anything that's right and you're the only one that's serving God as everybody should serve God, you must remember God's got a lot of people in this land today. You don't hear much about them, but they love the Lord. They're saved. They're born again at least, although they're not stirring up much for God. It'd be good to stir up some things for God occasionally and let people know we're still around and trying to do something for the Lord. Then we come to company number four, and that's the straddlers or the middle of the road men. Now you have some people, they like that. They want to straddle the fence. They want to live for God on Sunday, but go out and live for the world on Monday and the rest of the week. They say, good God on Sunday, and then they go out on Monday and talk like the world, act like the world. They sing, oh, how I love Jesus on Sunday, go out and sing a, a pistol packing mama on Monday. Now, we need to realize that God wants us to be consistent in what we're doing. If we sing for God on Sunday, sing for him on Monday as well. If you live for God on Sunday, live for God on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. You're going to have to face Monday about uh, 52 times a year and you might as well start living for God on Monday as well as on Sunday. And would you have the company like that? 
Like during the Civil War, this one very wise fellow had all the answers. He said, I know what I'll do. I'll live close to the Mason-Dixon line anyway. And I'll just put me on a gray coat and a pair of blue pants. And I'll get out between the two armies, the north and the south. And I'll have it made. I'll have that gray coat and the blue pants. And they really won't know who I am or what am I trying to do. But he was dead wrong, brother. He put on the gray coat and the blue pants and went out on the lines. And the north got him in the shoulders. And then the south got him from the hips down. So he was really fixed up. One army shot at his chest, the gray coat, and the other got his, 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 his britches, you know. And there they shot him down from two directions. And so he, he thought he was smart. He thought he was wise. He thought he could do both, but he couldn't. You have a lot of people like that today. They think they serve God and serve the world, serve the devil all at the same time. But you're not fooling God. You can't do that. You have the fence straddlers. I reminded the old man. His cow got out, and he was out looking for his cow and couldn't find her. And he said to his wife, he said, we got to find the old Bess somewhere or another. She's around, I'm sure. And I want you to come help me find this cow. And his wife came out and he said to his wife, he said, now I want you to go down on this side of this creek. I'm going down on the other side of this creek. He said, that devilish cow might be on both sides of this creek. So you have a lot of people like that today. You find them on both sides of the creek. Like the man in Texas jumped on his horse and rode off in every direction. Now you need to realize you must serve the Lord if you're going to serve God. And you can't serve God and Satan and the world all at the same time. God says, come out from and be ye separate, says the Lord, and I'll receive you. And so we find the fence straddlers here, Obadiah's example. He was a believer in Jehovah and a supporter of prophets, but he was running with the machine of that day. Now Obadiah stayed in the palace there with King Ahab and old lady Jezebel. And he was somewhat in charge of the preachers around there. I, I just assume he might have been the, uh, uh, maybe he was the president of the uh, Southern Baptist Convention or he might have been the uh, moderator of the association. But anyway, he was kind of in charge of the uh, preachers there in Ahab's uh, palace and kind of looked after them. And he wanted to stand in with King Ahab and old lady Jezebel at the same time, he wanted to stand in with the preachers, you know, of the convention and the association and whatnot. You got a lot of preachers like that today. They, they want to run along with the convention crowd and at the same time, they want to go along with the independents. But you can't do that and please God. You got to be on one side or the other. You can't straddle the fence. God knows where you are. Man said to me one time, he said, well, I think I can stay in and get more good done in than I can out. I said, brother, the only thing wrong with that is just isn't true. It's not scriptural. God said, come out. Now, what are you going to say about that? So he didn't have anything to say. And so you can't use that argument, but I can do more in than can out when God plainly said, come out. That's like going down and saying, well, I'm going down to the liquor store and drank with the liquor crowd so I can win them to God. Well, see how many you win to God. God says, come out and be ye separate. Then we come to company number five, and that's the bread and water prophets. A hundred prophets of the Lord is in a cave, the Bible tells us, divided into two camps, and they're looking for their bread and water. Obadiah furnished them with bread and water. He had 50 in this cave and 50 in that cave. He's trying to hide them from old lady Jezebel. Now, she really believed in chopping off heads. And she enjoyed chopping off the head of a preacher. Nothing tickled her anymore than to find a preacher that she could chop his head off. Well, chopping head off time turned around later on in her life. But she liked that. And Obadiah, all he did was uh, go and feed those prophets. Now, he must have gotten the food out of uh, Ahab's cupboard because of drought in the land. He lived in the palace. And he'd slip a little bread over here to these 50 preachers. He'd slip a little bread and water over to these 50 preachers. He wanted to stand in with them and stand in with Ahab and stand in with old lady Jezebel all at the same time. And so all they did is they ate their bread and drank their water. You have a lot of fellows like that in the ministry today. All they do is draw their breath and their salary, and that's it. Now, all they did is drink their water and ate their bread, no good for anyone, hid in a cave, afraid to come out, scared of old lady Jezebel. And so you have the bread and water prophets. And then number six, company number six, is the, you find the sky gazers. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 43 through 44, 
You find here where Elijah sent a man on the mountain to look and see if he could see a cloud coming up. He would stand there gazing to see if he could see a cloud arising. He finally saw one, not because he was gazing, but because the man on his knees down there praying. And today you have this guy gazes. They stand around and look for the Lord to come back, never do anything for God. Now we are to look for the Lord to come back. He may come at any time, but the way to look for the coming of the Lord is to be busy for the Lord. You have some of these cult leaders today leave their groups out up on a mountain. They ask them to sell all their goods and belongings. The Lord is coming back on a certain day and just go up there and sit and look for him. He'll be back. And they, they finally they have to give up and go back home and starve to death. You can't do that. You can't be a, a sky gazer and accomplish anything for God. You need to be busy for the Lord and look at the Lord at the same time expecting his return. Then we come to company number seven, and that is the one man, Elijah. Now, Elijah, the prophet of God, is a man that planted his knees in the sand. He had the knee prints in the sand. This old hairy prophet of God with old sheep clothes over his back there for his clothing, down on his knees calling on God. He didn't look very dignified, but he was God's prophet, God's man. And 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 42, Elijah went up to the top of Carmel cast himself down upon the earth, put his face between his knees. There he is praying, down on the ground, his face between his knees, he's calling on God. Now what's he praying for? He'd already had a showdown on Mount Carmel. He'd won the battle, and God promised to send rain. And Elijah prayed that God would stop up the heavens. Elijah said, God, don't let it rain now for a period of time. And he prayed it wouldn't rain for about three and a half years. And he stopped up the heavens. He had the showdown. He brought Israel back to God. He killed the prophets of Baal, 450. And now the time had come for the rain. Elijah, the man of God in James chapter 5, said he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And God stopped up the heavens. And then he prayed again that the stopper might be pulled out. And God pulled the stopper out and let the rain come. Now this man told King Ahab, said, You're, we're not going to get the rain around here I say so, whether you like it or not. Old man Ahab said, uh, you, you trouble Israel. You, you make it rough for us. He said, I, I'm not troubling Israel. You're no lady Jezebel. You, you're the ones troubling Israel, not me. You're the ones that are weak and ungodly. And when the people get right with God, we'll get some rain. And so they began to pray. He did and planted his knees in the sand. Got low before God and he wouldn't get up. Until his servant came back and said, I see a little cloud about the size of a man's hand. There you have four fingers, a thumb, five. That's the number of grace. That little cloud spoke of grace. And he came back and said, I saw a cloud about the size of a man's hand. He said, well, you better get moving. She's coming, brother. God's going to send a gully washer. God's going to send the rain. They began to get on the move. And the rain came and blessed the land and covered the land. When the man of God, God's lone prophet, get on the business and really talk to the God of heaven. That's the only way you or I, anyone's going to get anything done for God. We're going to have to make some prints in the sand with our knees or where we pray and stay there until God does something or keep praying until we get the answer. And eventually God will give you the answer and God will come to your rescue. I want to tell you this in closing. Some time ago, uh, this man then went to the penitentiary to preach, going down and preach the prisoners. And the chaplain there in the penitentiary said to him, he said, I want to tell you something that's very impressive. It happened many years ago. He said, there's a mother and a little nine-year-old daughter, beautiful golden-haired little blue-eyed girl coming down the street, very dainty, precious. And, and uh, there's a train. He stopped at the track for a few minutes. And out of the boxcar came a big, strong man, over six feet tall, husky, rough-looking man, the marks of sin on his face. And he had a chain about his wrist. He was chained to the sheriff. The little girl said, Mama, said, uh, what is that man doing there chained to that other man? And the mother said, Honey, I wish you hadn't asked me that. She said, Mama, I want to know. She said, there's a man chained to another man. She said, Honey, they, that man, they're taking him to prison. Uh, they're going to put him in a cell. He, st he stood before the judge. He's a wicked man. He's committed crime. And they're going to put him in a cell in prison little girl said mama what is a cell she explained that to the little girl and said mama what is the judge said, well the judge is the one that that gave the man the sentence they tried the man he's wicked he's ungodly said uh, he's a 
a cruel man. Said nobody cares anything about him. She said the mama will, uh, will his mama go with him to the uh, jail or the cell or the prison? Said no, honey. Said his mama won't be going with him. Said uh, nobody seems to care anything about him. Nobody seems to love him. And then she said, well, mama will, uh, will his mother move somewhere near the prison so she can be close to him? Mama said, don't I wish you'd hush. No, his, his mother's not going to move anywhere near the prison. And about that time, that little girl reached down and plucked a beautiful little rose. And she ran across the track and walked up to this big old husky man, handed it to him. He took the hand that he had free and took it. And she said to the man, said, Mr., said, uh, God loves you, and said, I, I want you to know that I love you too. And she went back to her mother. This chaplain said uh, to the minister, said, would you like to go down this afternoon at 5 o'clock and speak to the, the uh, endeavor, the Christian endeavor here in the penitentiary? He said, I'd be glad to. That, that afternoon at five, uh, 3 o'clock, they went down to speak to the prisoners, about 500 assembled there. And whenever they sat down, I walked on the platform, a man, over six feet tall, strong, broad shoulders, big smile on, the, on his face. And the first thing he said was, glory to God. Praise the Lord. And some of the people said the same. He said, get your hymn book and let's sing Jesus, love of my soul. And they took the hymn book and sang Jesus, love of my soul. They sang it the tune of threads among the gold. And you could just feel the power of God there as that big strong man led that singing. And then when they finished, he spoke to him from the word of God. The chaplain said, the uh, minister said, you know what happened? Said some time ago, I was walking down the cart and I saw a big old man sitting there in the cell, had a Bible in his hand and tears running down his cheeks. Said, I unlocked the, uh, the door of the cell and I walked in. I said, can I help you, sir? And he said, yes. And he said, open his Bible and there lay that little rose that he'd put there in that Bible and tears running down his cheeks. He said, sir, a little girl gave me this. And she told me that God loved me and that she loved me. He said, I didn't think anybody loved me. I didn't even think God loved me, but said, she loved me and God loves me. He said, uh, sir, chaplain, sir, I, I sure would like to know God. And he said, that was the easiest man he ever won to Jesus. Man fell down on his knees, asked God for mercy, and God saved him. And he said, God, uh, Chaplains and preachers, the chaplain said, Preacher, sir, that man has won many souls here in this prison to God. He's one of the greatest Christians I've ever known and one of the greatest soul winners I've ever seen. And he's won more souls to Jesus Christ in this prison than all the chaplains who've ever had to come to this prison. That one little touch, that little red rose, and the little word of love from a nine year old girl. God loves you, mister, and I love you too. Shall we stand? Our Father, I pray that you'll take the message and use it. We know you love sinners. God, you so loved the world, you gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God, we know this much can be accomplished to the glory of God if thy people would try to do it. Help us today. Help us to tell sinners that Jesus loves them. And we'd like to save them. God save somebody in the radio listening audience today. And we thank you for what you do in Christ's name. Amen. While Debbie plays on the instrument. If you're in this building unsaved. Backslidden. Want to come back to God. Join the church. And move down here for any reason you may. Want you obey God. Want you come. God is speaking to your heart. This message and the singings on cassette tape. Is tape number 166. Tape number 166. While we wait, would you come? God is speaking. Would you like to get saved? Would you like to come back to God? Would you like to join the church? Has God spoken to you about anything in particular that you'd like to come down here and talk to him about? While we wait, would you come?
I brought you the message God laid on my heart. The responsibility is on you. You have ample time to respond. Waiting just a few more seconds. Nobody responds to this invitation. We're going home. How about it? <laughs>